Sarah, maybe you could start by telling listeners a little bit about the focus of your PhD and the kinds of organisations that you've chosen to research. And I guess, why now? What What is sort of compelling you to dive into this at, at this stage? That's a good question, Lisa. I've had a career in organisational leadership having undertaken a range of executive roles, mainly in small to medium enterprises, and having spent the last couple of years reading about organisations, I think we all know what isn't working. I also have confidence, though. I'm confident that we can govern organisations better. And I take seriously the the much quoted statement from Einstein that says we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we use to make them. So that says to me looking and trying to tweak the current system and expecting transformation will not lead to a massive change. So I started my inquiry by really taking a very big perspective which is the challenges of a thing called the Anthropocene Epoch. The Anthropocene, while it's a contested idea, calls for humans to operate with greater awareness of Earth's life-supporting complex and interrelated systems. So going from that really, really big millennial perspective, I thought, are there any forms of governing that appear to think systemically, that think holistically. And in that inquiry, I found non-hierarchical organisations. And in doing that, I also came across a number of different approaches for how to create a self-organising non-hierarchical organisation, such as teal, holacracy, sociocracy, etc. But really... I'm not so much interested in advocating any of those particular technologies. I'm more interested in what's happening in the organisations that have adopted a horizontal structure. So that was my starting point. And you've picked four examples of non-hierarchical organisations, is that right? Yes. Well, pick them is an interesting word. I asked a number of my networks around the planet for organisations they would recommend as being confident in their um, their horizontal structure. And I was actually amazed, Lisa, at how hard it was to find organisations. Um, one of them, the Inspiral Foundation, was recommended to me by someone in the UK and they didn't know of them, they just heard of them. So that was one, the Inspiral Foundation based in Wellington, but very much a global network. Another was the Sustainable Economies Law Centre in Oakland, California. One very local to me here in Melbourne, in Australia, is Friends of the Earth Melbourne. And I'd known them for a number of years and was familiar with their different way of organising. So that one was easy. And the fourth one was the Pachamama Alliance, in San Francisco, Um, and that organisation I also have had a long-term relationship with as a donor and also a participant in their work. So I knew some of their journey as well. But it was very difficult to find organisations that really were involved and doing this. And some of the ones that might seem like they were or would naturally be non-hierarchical, actually still were adopting very traditional structures. I should say I'm also focusing my attention on not-for-profit organisations who have a commitment, a mission for social, political, legal and environmental change. Because I was interested in that, I suppose, the, the juxtaposition or the congruence between what the mission is for the world, what we're trying to change as an organisation, and then how we structure ourselves and our relationships with staff and stakeholders. I'm really curious to know more about what some of your findings have been around how does 
a non-hierarchical way of organizing or governance structure, how does that support organizations like NGOs or organizations in general be more sort of holistic and aware of the ecosystem in which they're operating? I think supporting the work of many organizations, whether they be for profit or not for profit, to become non-hierarchical. There are some wonderful um, thinkers who are creating models for us that help us understand possible pathways to our transformation. And the work of Otto Sharma and John Gebser are two of my favorites. I go to their work to find a sense of where we might be going. But then I look at the organizations and I think of how I work in an organization. We don't necessarily hold those models where we're in practice. We tend to be habitual and pragmatic as well as responsive to things outside of ourselves and constrained by our community, our particular culture. So part of this research really is about noticing the lived experience of the non-hierarchical organisations and then reflecting back to the work of Otto Sharma or Jean Gebser. And I'm beginning to feel that maybe non-hierarchical organisations might contribute to creating a healthy, peaceful and just world. So Sarah, I know you've uh, intentionally used some creative tools and perhaps a different approach in the research methodology for your PhD. Can you say a little bit about what some of those creative tools were and what the rationale behind using different research tools was? Creative tools really excite me, Lisa. And having a background in education as well as in leadership means that I've worked with and see how groups and children particularly, how children create, play and come to new understandings. So I wanted to bring tools that bring lightness into my methodology and to open us up beyond just thinking cognitively and feeling anxious about making the right answer. There are a number of of elements to creative processes and I think there are, there are some keys if anyone's thinking of engaging with them. Firstly, they need to be experiential. They want to take us beyond our intellectual engagement and amplify the space between a finished meaning being made. So we want to create time for us to make new connections, new stories and see metaphors emerge that we may not have thought existed. Often processes include some sort of artefact or a physical embodiment standing up, moving, even if it's standing up and moving from one side of the room to another. That physical movement can change a sense of the room, ourselves, our relationship with other people. And bringing this into um, an organisational context for me was very important because governance is pretty serious and organisational leadership, we often forget to play, we forget to laugh and many organisations don't have a lot of humour in the boardroom. I was very satisfied to see many of the, well, in fact, all four organisations expressing a lightness of being in their governance practices. Igniting our imaginations and our emotions actually brings us to our heart, to our feelings. And governance for me has been something I felt passionate about working in organisations. We want the best outcome. We want things to happen, and when they don't, we often feel upset, concerned, and all of those water cooler conversations tend to be less productive if that's the case. So bringing experiential activities into the interview really gave an opportunity for participants to to play, yes, and also to maybe find different connections. One process I call the poetics 
of found objects. Here, we engage with an object, just a random, fairly uncurated object. And that object will call forth our creative interpretation and response. Everyday objects, such as a rock, will have a feeling. We can pick it up, we can move it around in our hands. We sort of engage with it just through that action. It stimulates ideas and images. In my research interviews, I invited people to put marks on paper. Lisa, that's meant to be a non-stressful way of draw, saying drawing. <laughs> I love it. People often feel quite anxious as soon as you show an empty piece of paper and pencils. And I invite them to illustrate the dynamics of their organisation, the governance, the energy, how it flows, where decisions were made, where decisions got stuck, whatever came to mind. And I became entranced in the way this process opened up new metaphors about the organization's experience and that person's experience in the organization. It led us into some very rich conversations. One person, for example, imagined their organization as a rainforest. Within that metaphor, every part of the organization had value an intersecting role, seasonal change, there was an element of decay, renewal, seeking the light, lots of interesting things. Theoretically, this is described as a performative moment when we draw. And in that moment, our unconscious and subconscious perceptions, such as our memories and our connections, emerge. That's why these creative methodologies are particularly powerful. If we stay in our usual cognitive, focused, intellectual mind, that sort of free flow won't occur. So I found that in the parts of my conversations with people where we played through drawing or through selection of images, I suppose more surprising depth, surprising ideas for the interviewee and for myself emerged. Images are used as potent awakeners in marketing, on the television, film, and also in this research. I've used uh, a collection of postcards as stimulus sometimes, and with these four organisations, I used the mother piece Tarot Deck which were designed in 1981 by Vicky Noble and Karen Vogel. These cards, if you're familiar with tarot cards, there are 78 cards which encompass the human life journey. So the cards are very powerful in their archetypal resonance. They also, this particular card set, was designed to be feminist, to represent a diverse perspective of sexuality, of racial types, skin colours, as well as being full of magical and mythical symbols, which inspired people and also excited them and made them laugh. Yeah, I, I love that. I think it, it kind of circles back to your point earlier about Einstein's quote, that we're not going to solve today's problems with the same thinking that created them in the first place. And I think it makes sense then to look at the very way that we study or research other organisations to learn about them and in order to, you know, create new models of our own. So I love that you're helping the organisations that you researched to look at their organisations through different metaphors and creative tools and kind of tapping into whole body wisdom, I guess, it, it makes total sense. And I think it makes sense in terms of contributing to helping the wider population, yeah, access something about what is it that these people are doing differently and how can we start to think about organisations in a more holistic and systemic way. And part of that starts with how we look at them. It's a bit like the whole Schrodinger's cat thing, <laughs> the, the, the nature of how we observe things and how that influences what we take away from it. Absolutely, Lisa. And I've, I've found a very interesting parallel 
if we look in society and we have our mainstream organisations which are hierarchical and then we've got these small, a small outlying groups that are exploring different models. The same applies for academic research. Mostly it's very, I suppose, intellectually focused, having to be rational, linear, argued in an intellectual manner with a lot of facts and data. I have a lot of facts and data, but I've gathered them in a different way, substantiating the traditional ways with other creative ways. And again, I'm part of a group of outliers who've existed for many decades trying to bring different ways of thinking into academe that are going to, I suppose, speak more to the whole person, speak more to social change, intellectual change, and create new systems, education systems. So, yes, very connected. It's not, this sort of research is not separate from the community I'm wanting to understand better. So what are some of the examples then, if you could share with our listeners, that you came across in these organisations? What are some practical examples of things that they are doing differently in these non-hierarchical ways of organising? I think one of the most impactful examples of difference is the idea that everyone would be paid the same amount in the organisation. Uh, both Friends of the Earth Melbourne and the Sustainable Economies Law Centre adopt that policy. If there is a pay increase, the group decides whether the organisation can do it, should do it, when and how. If you just imagine that for a moment, it eliminates the need to compete with your peers, with your co-workers to move up the hierarchy to succeed and to earn more. So that's a pretty profound difference. A second one is more than a practice. It's actually a philosophy, and that's a commitment to transparency. A number of technological tools exist now to really assist this and make it possible. One such tool is Lumio which is a decision-making platform, and that facilitates the global participation and asynchronous decision-making used by the Inspiral Foundation. And there's a lot of conversation about the value of something like asynchronous decision-making, particularly for people who don't operate as well in a group situation, people who might be more introverted or might require time to consider their decisions outside the intensity of, of a meeting. And so that's been seen as very valuable for a number of organisations. The commitment to transparency also shows up in an open source approach to sharing policies and constitutions. In Spiral, the Sustainable Economies Law Centre and a larger network of organisations involved in the US called the Not-for-Profit Democracy Network work together to share their information so that the, this community of practitioners can strengthen and develop further. This approach unpacks the various tasks of management and leadership and effectively separates them from the personality which is usually where organisations, they see the leader as a personality rather than a role. Another practice I find was common to all four organisations was integrating everyday processes that help to develop the human skills of each person in the organisation. Words like trust, care, love, belonging, community and family were used frequently when I asked people the qualities that characterise their engagement together. And I think this really underlines the effectiveness of these organisations. One extraordinary conversation that 
emerged in each of the organisations in a different way, dependent on what was floating around at the particular time I walked into it, were conversations around power, unpacking power, understanding power. It might be power related to gender, power related to roles, and being prepared to talk, not maybe as part of the everyday organisational got to make decisions, move our projects on, but having conversations from time to time to understand power. The four organisations I worked with, of course, were all colonial countries, Australia, New Zealand and North America. And these organisations are very willing to understand what is the impact of being brought up within a colonised country. How do we become aware of how we perpetuate colonising, particularly if we are white and male or white and female in a different way, but there's relationships with people who have less privilege than ourselves. So that conversation was alive and possible. And the thing that I really noticed was that those conversations were undertaken without people becoming upset or offended. They might take time to process or not be ready to continue to talk about it, but people took responsibility for their learning and engagement. So it's really interesting because you, you started to touch on, you know, those kinds of conversations about positional power and self-awareness. What are some of the other human skills that you found these organisations were conscious about developing that, you know, other organisations or, or people could learn from? Like what, what skills from a human and relational perspective do you think are important to cultivate in order to work in more non-hierarchical ways? The human skills really speak to a major difference that I observed in a non-hierarchical organisation, which is the commitment to interior work. By that I mean, you know, me work or you work, Lisa, on the things that you react to becoming, I suppose, more self-aware of who we are and how we are. And that's, that's a pretty big change from an ordinary organisation where really our interior state is our own business. But here we're, we're bringing more of ourselves to work. Otto Sharma would say this is an example of an organisation moving from a state of separation to one of integration, of people moving from separation to integration. So here are some of the the things that I observed that these organisations did. One of them was to sit together in circle, which is a very important non-hierarchical symbol in its structure. There's no edges there. But to sit in circle together daily. might be over lunch, in meetings. But there was a sense of meeting together. And there's a lot of conversation about listening The skill of listening really is something that has to be cultivated because within listening, we have the question of how we listen. So I notice people using a phrase like, I'm curious about, and that instantly opens a conversation in a different way than a repartee where I'm having to defend myself more. There was also a sense of being able to listen to the centre rather than to an individual speaker. Listening to the centre might mean listening to what are we working on here? What is going to be the best outcome for the organisation at this point? And so there there appeared to be less attachment to my idea or my strategy. I saw a lot of Really, it seemed like effortless letting go once everyone had talked through an idea. And I think the process of decision-making where you work an idea through a number of iterations with different purposes to each iteration, sometimes to listen, 
sometimes to offer a concern, other times to vote, etc. That really gave people time, time to listen to many aspects of each decision. I also noticed patience. And sometimes this was a bit of a learning edge because it's a hard one for all of us. But the patience for differences to exist, particularly if they're philosophical, patience in the onboarding process where you're learning a new way of working and encompassing a number of different technological platforms. And not just a new way of working in an organisation, like a radical shift for your expectations of yourself and your team. And I think I've observed over the last eight months with the Sustainable Economies Law Centre and the Not-for-Profit Democracy Network, a lot of conversation about how do we support people with onboarding and giving people buddies, giving people space to share where they need support to get how this new system works. One very important human skill is that of being able to sit in a circle and value that person who brings up an idea very different to your own. I think conflict is expressed slightly differently in a non-hierarchical organisation. Firstly, it's able to be more upfront, and if ideas are received with curiosity, then my different perspective won't be seen as something to be attacked or destroyed it will be seen maybe as an opportunity to listen to something that might give us an idea of something we need to attend to, a new pattern or an opportunity for our organisation to respond to in a very proactive and beneficial way. So what are some of the shadow sides and the challenges that you encountered when observing these organisations in this kind of non-hierarchical way of working? Um, I just want, I'd like to start with giving you a sense of my sense of what shadow is. Shadow work involves becoming aware of the parts of our organisational self that we're unable to know. So it's a bit of a conundrum to start with. How do we get underneath to even know what it is that we're unconscious about as a group? The goal of bringing shadows into the light is the insights and the new opportunities and the great power that comes through integration. Shadows aren't necessarily negative. They are really just unconscious. And because they're unconscious, because they've been put outside the sense of this is who we are, they can be emotionally strong trigger points. And I think that's what I've found with the organisations in different ways. And I suppose the context we have to think about a non-hierarchical organisation is where does a non-hierarchical organisation fit with the dominant hierarchical system it's part of because it has to exist within this world it has to make money it has to keep on growing it has to communicate itself when it's slightly weird one thing that came up fairly consistently was a, a sense of uh, unease or just putting to the side the whole issue of money and marketing yourself and it was particularly for some NGOs, it can be seen as a bit of a mucky thing. You know, you can be contaminated by that terrible stuff, yet money is needed to function in society. That was one aspect of money. Another aspect of money was how do we communicate our benefits when we are so different? Is there a clear way that we can say invest in this even though, or donate your money to this, even though it doesn't look and feel the same way. So developing a way of selling the value of the structure felt a bit like a challenge because it's something that might, if you're making a transition from hierarchy to non-hierarchy, it's something that takes time. 
Another shadow that definitely emerged was a fear of hierarchy. Because, of course, hierarchy is the opposite to in some ways. And so what do we do when there are natural hierarchies? One thing that was a very interesting shadow, again, this was consistent, was the question of founders. And this issue didn't emerge with the founder themselves. They were usually unaware of it being a concern. It it more emerged as a sense of concern or worry that the founder, what would happen when that founder moved on. And so it really showed up that there, that visionary leadership of the founder still impacts in a non-hierarchical environment. I think that one's got a lot more to be explored. And I, I, I think there are others also starting to see that as a bit of a, a thread. This is definitely a process, Lisa, of shifting from hierarchy to non-hierarchy because we've all been so well trained in hierarchy and we can't help but look at that person who was the founder, who holds so much knowledge, passion and vision. It's very easy to project our hopes and fears onto that person and then shadow emerges. Another area of shadow which really marks the horizontal organisation is the issue of responsible accountability, particularly when we look at the power of relationship between these people in these organisations. Giving feedback without the protection of hierarchy and without damaging those relationships emerged as a challenge. I think this is a challenge for personal skills and harks back to the importance for the human skills, but also it shows up the importance of collective agreements about deliverables with projects and tasks. And it calls for even greater clarity than in a hierarchy for interpersonal boundaries. The competition and winning is a way of approaching the world that we've all been brought up to excel at, if possible. And we've been nurtured and rewarded to compete and to win. So in a non-hierarchical environment, those qualities of winning can be banished as that's not us. But then there's a deficit because we also need to celebrate, celebrate successes and collectively share the success. So that's another, I think, a learning edge or a tension for some non-hierarchical organisations. Finally, there have been very interesting conversations I was party to about the bringing into visibility the invisible work that was often undertaken by women. Now, this might be things like ensuring the catering is in place for that event, hosting people as they enter the space, not opening the conference or the the symposium, but just the the welcoming, details of time management, following up, soothing and smoothing people when there's some sort of disruption. And Inspiral have been very strong on having these conversations, as have Self and Friends of the Earth Melbourne that I witnessed. So there is a collective approach to let's clean up the space together or a handing over in a conscious way. I've been carrying all of these small details over to you now from the woman to the man. And that's been really interesting and I noted some very, I suppose, humble and willing responses from the men, really acknowledging what is held in that multitasking care work that is undertaken by women. So that felt like quite a profound central point of shifting and the possibility of moving towards gender 
equality. Yeah, that's so interesting. I love your framing about the shadow and bringing the shadow into the light and that it's not necessarily something bad, it's just something unconscious and, and making it visible means that we can start to talk about it in the open and, and make different choices. So I I hear some really familiar patterns as well there about yeah accountability and, and responsibility in a self managing organization how do you do that without reverting to the sort of top down command and control style of working or leadership that we so want to avoid and at the same time how can we how can we become aware of our allergies to anything that resembles a, a sort of hierarchy or, or or kind of coercion and and actually embrace some of the aspects of of that or integrate some of the aspects of those worldviews I guess that are important like celebrating successes or you know recognizing when someone has uh, kind of influence or leadership and it's emerged in an organic way and and making that visible and and transparent. Absolutely and I think even though we weren't going to talk about it I just want to say a little tiny thing about language because I think that fits into it because our words are so much part of our culture and we've talked about these organisations being outliers from the mainstream, having some consciousness about the words we use helps us transition our organisational culture. And I wanted to tell you a story from last night. I went to a dinner party and I was talking about my research and one person said, oh, come on. I don't think human beings want to work like that. I think we need to have someone to make the hard decisions. And not everyone has the same personality, the personality of the leader. Without leaders, we're going to have anarchy. Who's going to keep control? And I found that so interesting because my experience with these case study organisations is that there is so much order. There's space for things to emerge and there's great flexibility, but the structure is incredibly clear and well understood by everyone. So horizontal organisations are not leaderless. The difference is all people are nurtured as leaders. All people are empowered. Even though they won't do the same thing, they won't be drawn to take the same role or tasks, they have the ability to participate in decision-making. The Constitution provides the guidelines to inform decisions and behaviour. It's not up to an individual, a leader, to make those decisions. Yeah, that's really interesting. I I hear that a lot, that, that people think it's fantasy for people to work without managers or having someone to lead them. And I I do think so much of that is our conditioning that we're sort of unconscious to. But I do think that's one of the challenges is sort of unlearning some of those ways ways of being. What would you say uh, is the greatest challenge for for organisations who are wanting to transition into non-hierarchical ways of working? Lisa, I think there are three, if you'll allow me to be so indulgent. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to share. One is, well, two of them are related to capacity building because I think that's the biggest challenge. We need new capacities for a new organisation. So the first is to commit to the transformative culture, to doing the work on the inside and to develop the skills to see collective patterns. We haven't had to see things in patterns. We've focused on the minutiae rather than the whole. So that's a whole level of skill. Each of my case study organisations have committed to creating reflective spaces to facilitate their continued learning and transformation. That can be a regular monthly working on the group and for many of them they also have an annual retreat that might be a week, a number of days, that may be facilitated and have particular themes. And, of course, taking time out, even for non-hierarchical organisations committed to growth, 
can be resisted, like, you know, regular exercise or the healthy eating program. But everyone reported the value and noticed when they did less of that sort of reflective time. So that was a very important part of capacity building outside the deliverables of day-to-day -day work. The second part of capacity building is bringing emotion and imagination into work through play and embodied activity. There are so many creative ways of engaging ourselves. Try drawing, movement, and as I've described, using objects. It was great to see the Sustainable Economies Law Centre mob getting out their pens and starting to use that sort of storytelling. And if you're ever stuck for an idea, just ask a child under 12 for their assistance and they'll, they'll give you a, a bundle of great ideas. One thing I haven't mentioned that was very much part of the transition was having time for conscious repair and healing. I talked at the beginning about the disengagement that has been documented about people working in, in traditional organisations. There is a sense of brokenness about the system and to change a brokenness there has to be healing and rebuilding of trust in the organisations, trust that we can really say what's important to us without being penalised. And also trust for us to learn how to participate differently, but also to unlearn dominating behaviours that have been previously rewarded in hierarchy and in organisations where extracting the most from employees is the way of working. So we really we need to have intelligently facilitated opportunities to heal from the accumulated traumas of hierarchy, to build a sense of safety in the group and really in ourselves. I think, finally, to move our societies beyond extraction and exploitation is a massive shift. If we're going to start to regenerate our organisations impacting on the environment, it takes time patience, nurturing, feeding. We also have to have a belief and a sense of a vision that this vibrant human sharing economy can be achieved. So I think there's a good dose of faith as well.